Well, for, I'm going to do the, I'm going to break one of the cardinal rules of giving a talk. I'm going to tell you what's wrong. I have, I'm getting laryngitis or getting over laryngitis. I don't normally sound like the frog man. So if I lose my voice part way through, I apologize, and it's a great thing that I'm being mic'd, because normally I don't like to be mic'd, because my voice is really loud and projects, and the mic tends to blow people out of their chairs. So thank you for putting up with that. I have to give an introduction. My name is Les Johnson. All the requisite contact information is up here. I do work for NASA at the Marshall Space Flight Center down in Huntsville, but I'm not here representing NASA this weekend. I'm here as myself. Uh, partly as a uh, published author, I write uh, science fiction books or Bayon books, if there are any science fiction fans, uh, I suspect there are. I also write popular science books about space and space exploration. And I love to get out and talk about space and tell people basically uh, about how space technology can benefit them here on Earth and some of the things that are happening in the space community. I'll be giving three talks this weekend. This is the first of three, and this talk originated uh, as an idea, which it ultimately became a book called Sky Alert, When Satellites Failed, that's published by Springer Books, because of a visit to Dollar General. We have a Dollar General market in Madison, where I live, which is a suburb of Huntsville. And if you've never been into Dollar General market, you need to give it a try, because it's like a little miniature Walmart. I mean, they've got produce, they've got everything you need. And I was checking out one day on a honeydew list, uh, to check out some stuff to bring home. And there was a huge line at the checkout, and it wasn't moving. And finally, the manager, uh, looking rather hairy, uh, walked over with his checkout box and put it down and said, I can check you out if you're cash only, but if you have to have a check or credit card, I can't check you out. I thought, well, that's odd, so what's going on? And I was one of the few people, apparently, that still carries cash or had enough cash to get what I was going to buy. And I asked the manager of the Dollar General, why can't you check everyone out? And he said, well, our VSAT link is down. And, you know, I work for NASA. I've, I've been there for 24 years. I'm the principal investigator on a mission that's going to fly a solar sail to an asteroid in three years. So I think I know a little bit about space. And if you want to hear more about that, come to my talk tomorrow on solar sailing. But I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, we do all of our credit card and telecheck verifications on secure satellite link because dial-up is too slow and the internet's insecure, as you all are scaring me to death with your <laughs> stories today, and I'm learning. <laughs> so they use secure satellite link to do direct to the, to the verification system to verify all that, and their satellite link was down. And so they couldn't check anybody out. And I said, well, how common is this? And he said, well, when you go out and you drive home, look at the top of the stores on the way home, and you'll see satellite dishes on the top of the, of the, of the Kroger. You'll see it at the Texaco. That's not so people can watch direct TV in the break room. That's for VSAT communication. So I went home, and I started looking into it. And I suddenly uh, had one of those aha moments where I really knew this, but it had never quite congealed down to a succinct thought. We're going to be hosed really badly if we lose our satellites. And that one little event was the catalyst that got me thinking about how we space advocates, when people say, what has space done for me? I'm gonna convince you in this talk today that space technology has gone so far that our economy now depends on it. We have won. We space advocates have succeeded beyond our wildest dreams and it terrifies me. And you'll see why as we go through this talk. And by the way, I like questions. If it's a burning question and you can't hold it, go ahead and raise your hand. If you can, let's kind of wait toward the end, but I don't want you to forget. And if you think you'll forget, go ahead and ask. So let me, uh, let me get going here. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is that if you've been watching the news this week, you've been hearing about this massive solar flare sunspot on the sun. It's the size of eight Earths, at least. It's huge. It's just rotated to be on the far side of the sun from us, so we can't see it right now. And we don't know what it's doing. But we do know it's enormous. It's one of the biggest uh, sunspots in, in decades. And fortunately, it has not been doing something called a coronal mass ejection. A coronal mass ejection is where it's not just pretty lights and it's a little bit different temperature on the sun and it's, a, it's actually a storm on the sun, a magnetic storm. But a coronal mass ejection is where some of the matter in the outer corona of the sun gets pushed out into the solar system. And this matter is basically uh, a plasma. It's protons, electrons, and it traps a magnetic field in it, and it comes out, and if you ever watched the original Star Trek and they were trying to run from the, the, the cloaked ships 
uh, uh, photon torpedo that was this massive uh, thing that disrupted everything on the Enterprise. That's what that is. And they spew out from the sun regularly. And when they hit the Earth, most of them aren't very powerful. Satellites actually have to batten down the hatches and shut down some equipment. The uh, Chandra Space Telescope, the X-ray telescope, actually reorients itself to protect its electronics from these solar storms or they might get fried. And these happen fairly regularly. However, in the 1850s, and 1859, there was a really, really big coronal mass ejection. And it's named after a good British scientist, as most scientists were good British scientists in the 19th century, right? Lord Carrington, who was studying the sun, noticed the sun was really, really active. He was using his telescope. And this was in the early days of, of telegraph, right? Just, uh, just prior to the Civil War. And telegraphs were in England and they were in the United States. Well, what happened was this solar storm, this coronal mass ejection, hit the Earth. It pushes our magnetic field down toward the Earth. And this magnetic field kind of protects our satellites. It's why the astronauts on the space station don't have to worry about solar radiation so much. They're down below and well within the Earth's magnetic field. But when these solar storms hit the Earth, they compress this magnetic field down toward the Earth and would strip that protection away. And it's, it goes so close to the Earth that a changing magnetic field crosses, uh, uh, at this time it was the telegraph lines, and it started inducing currents in it, because that's how we generate electricity, is changing magnetic field with a wire. And it actually caused telegraph lines to catch fire and burn off the poles. Telegraphs didn't need uh, batteries or power to operate. They started going on their own. And, and it was Lord Carrington and others that correlated this solar activity with what was happening on the ground. Well, the good thing is we didn't have satellites in 1859. Because that storm was so massive, the estimates are that if it happened today, we would lose most of our commercial satellites in orbit. They would be fried. A lot of the DOD satellites would be damaged, but a lot of them are hardened to survive basically nuclear war in space. And so our defense satellites would probably mostly be OK. Some might sustain damage. But we would lose almost all, if not all, of our civilian satellites. And that would be really bad, as you'll see as this talk goes forward. The good thing is, since the space age began, we haven't had an event of that size. The bad thing is, we don't know how often these happen. It happened in 1859. Are these events that happen once every 1,000 years? every 500 years, every 150 years, in, case, in, in which case we'd be due for another one. Uh, solar physicists, and there are several of them I know, don't have a clue how often the sun sends out these really massive coronal mass ejections. We just know that since we've been in space, the sun has been fairly benign, and we really haven't had to worry about it. But it's a big unknown. There's another problem that could cause us to lose our satellites, and that's space debris. Anybody familiar with space debris? Okay, well, the first objects that were debris objects, let me go back and run through that again, began when we launched our first satellites in the 1960s. Basically, rocket goes up, kicks off the satellite, the fairing, oops, I wave my arms a lot, the fairing opens up, but nuts and bolts fall off, um, insulation falls off. Well, guess what? It's moving orbital velocity, it's going to stay in space eight kilometers a second, faster than any bullet you can shoot on the Earth, okay? So even a pea traveling at eight kilometers a second is going to damage severely a satellite if it hits it. So when we launched Explorer 1, the Russians launched Sputnik, we started putting junk in orbit. The thinking was, <clears throat> space is big. <laughs> Seriously, that was the thinking. Don't worry about it. Space is big. We've had a lot of launches then, since then. The cataloged objects greater than 10 centimeters in diameter, <coughs> and my voice is really going to give me problems, has grown dramatically. <coughs> and the problem is, if you look at the uncatalogued debris, yes, sir? So with all the uh, <coughs> space junk up there, <coughs> I may not be able to finish my talk. I'm sorry, I'm getting really. So with all the space junk up there, it's still in microgravity. Is there like a half-life or something that we think it's going to fall out and burn up on re-entry? Depends on the altitude. If it's below about 500 kilometers, and a lot of it is, the atmosphere moves up and down during the day. <clears throat> the atmosphere expands and night it contracts. 
When the sun is active, it expands. And so a little bit of atmosphere goes up there and it causes aerodynamic drag and it'll bring some of it in. Under about 300 kilometers, it cleans itself out pretty well. Up at 1,000 kilometers or out to geo, it's going to be there for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Eventually, the stuff in geo will get cleaned out because the gravity of the moon will disturb its orbit enough that it will cause it to go into a, a different orbital and clean out. But that's over like tens of thousands of years. So if you look at the numbers, there are uh, tens of thousands of debris objects that are 10 centimeters or diameter or, or larger that are up there. The uncatalogued objects, which means they're things we see on radar, but they're less than 10 centimeters in size and they don't want to bother tracking them. Half a million, easily. Now, there is a scientist, his name's uh, Kessler. He was at the Johnson Space Center before he retired. He did a calculation at what point there's so much debris up there that any satellite you put up has a chance of being hit and destroyed in its lifetime. And that, that, that syndrome where you would launch one and it would get hit, and if a satellite gets hit by something moving at eight kilometers a second, it basically creates tens, hundreds, if not thousands of more debris pieces. So it's sort of like a, ch a runaway chain reaction in a nuclear uh, reactor, okay? And this debris goes every which way. There's no priority orbit for it. And so this is called the Kessler effect or the Kessler syndrome. And we haven't reached that tipping point yet. We don't know when we will, but there will be a point that if we keep putting this junk up there, that we have a runaway debris cloud that will basically destroy just about everything we have in orbit. And we're not to that point yet. Uh, US, Japan, uh, Europe all have uh, debris mitigation policies now that say basically when you launch something, you have to minimize the junk you put up with it, and your spacecraft at the end of its life has to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere within 25 years of it ending its life. And so basically we're saving rocket fuel, and when a satellite's at over finished its mission, it, it shoots itself into the atmosphere to burn up, is basically what that does. But it's a problem. This graph scares me. What you can see is the growth of the cataloged objects with time. And the curve starts back in the, uh, I believe I can't read it myself here, back in the, uh, looks like 1960s, and goes forward. And you'll notice there are two big jumps that happen. One is called the destruction of Fingen 1C, and one is the Iridium-33 Cosmos collision. Well, that first one is a huge increase in the number of debris objects caused by China. China said, you know, we know the U.S. and the Russians have the ability to knock out satellites. And the U.S. uses satellite technology very extensively with its military. So we're going to tell the U.S. by demonstrating that you're not invincible. So they found one of their old weather satellites that was dead, and they launched a missile into space and blew it up. The problem is it was in a high altitude. So all of the debris they created is going to remain in orbit. Okay? Now, a few months later, people say, and I, I know about this, well, the U.S. did it too. We blew up a satellite to show that we still had the capability. Well, yeah, we did. We had to do our macho thing and show we can still do that. But we picked a satellite that was in a low orbit that was about to re-enter. So when we blew it up, all the junk came in the atmosphere and burned up and did not increase the debris problem. Okay? So that huge spike right there, you can see prior to that, things had pretty much leveled off because countries had realized we need to do something about this. Then you have that big jump. The next one was an accidental collision of two act, uh, one active satellite with a dead satellite. A dead Russian satellite hit an Iridium satellite, knocked them both out, and created a lot more debris. That's going to happen more and more often. Okay, So this is a risk to our satellites. Of course, space war is a risk. What a lot of people don't realize is that you know space is hard to get to, but there are a lot of countries that have access to space now. US, Russia, China, Europe, Japan, Iran, okay? Uh, they, they put satellites in space. If you can put a satellite in space, one, you can build a ballistic missile. Two, you can load your satellite up with ball bearings and explosives and go to a region where you know the other countries have spy satellites and just put a lot of debris in their path and you could conceivably, that would be a poor man's ASAT. Doesn't have to hit the target directly, just get close, put a lot of debris in the path, 
take out the satellite. So uh, space war is a risk. Space nuclear war is a big risk. Uh, that has fortunately not happened, but that was actually planned for back in during the Cold War days and fortunately never happened. But this talk is about what would happen if we lose our satellites. Those are three ways that we could conceivably lose most of our satellites. One is nature. We have absolutely no control over it, the sun. One is basically us polluting space, which we have some control over. And the third one is intentional, which we also have some control over. And being a hackers conference, I have a slide that I put at the end and I should have moved it up because really now is the time I want to talk about it. We have had satellites hacked. Okay? One thing you need to know about that though is international law. I don't know if it's a law or policy, it's more policy. You hack a US satellite, it's considered an act of war. Okay? So if a foreign government, and it can be traced to a foreign government, actually hacks somebody else's satellite, by most countries' policies, that's an act of war, all right? So it's my understanding when the hack happened of a, of a domestic U.S. satellite, th whoever the hackers were just showed that they could get into the system. They didn't actually send any commands to the satellite, which was probably a really good thing, okay? Just for lots of reasons, but it has happened. And that's, that's also not, not a good thing when you think about what could happen if we lose our satellites. But let me get into the meat of the talk. GPS. We all love our GPS, right? I use GPS to find this hotel today. It's great. Got it in my phone. Have one in my car. Well, guess what? Everybody loves it so much we're dependent on it. How many people know that Rand McNally is essentially out of business, right? Mapping companies are gone. GPS is, is used in so many ways. And other countries are putting up their own GPS systems because they're afraid that the U.S. will turn off GPS and they'll be stuck without it. The Russians are putting up something called GLONASS. The Europeans are putting up the Galileo system. The Chinese are building their own version of GPS because for position tracking, there's not much better. Well, let's talk about that. Within the next few years, we're going away from our ground-based radio-controlled aircraft and we're going to what's called next-gen air traffic control means all of commercial flights will use GPS for navigation. Not just commercial airline flights, freight. Has anybody seen the Memphis airport after midnight? Yep. Oh my gosh, okay, FedEx hub. My wife who's sitting at the back, by the way, I'll put in a plug, she's got my books for sale back there if anybody's interested. Um, we, were, we were privileged to get a midnight tour of the FedEx hub. It was incredible, they take over air traffic control in Memphis and the cargo planes start coming in from all over the world. They, they shuffle the packages and send them back out again. But air traffic control is going to be done by GPS. Medicines, letters, computers, all the stuff we send by FedEx, we send by parcel, gets flown. Air traffic, 8,000 flights in the air at any given moment over North America, controlled by GPS in just the next few years. Trains are already there. There was a tragic accident about 10 years ago where a commuter train hit a freight train and several people died. Congress said in this day of communications and internet and everything else, this shouldn't happen. So they passed a law that said we need to have better control and knowledge of where all the trains are on the nation's train grid. And they went to positive train control. It's all GPS. So when you're in the trains, you may have, you may have people driving them but they're keeping track of where everything is on all the freight lines so there aren't collisions and the traffic's flowing smoothly because there are transponders on all of them and everybody knows where everybody else is located, all being controlled by GPS. Now at first glance, you wouldn't think that other than losing Google Maps or Apple Maps, if you use that on your phone, that you'd be affected by the loss of GPS with your cell phone. Well, in order to route your call or your internet search, for Verizon's network or AT&T's network, you have all these packets of data. Some of those packets of data are very precise position and time stamps in those signals. And in order to route this data in these networks as efficiently as they do, the time stamp is vitally important. Turns out, all these cell phone towers use GPS to have a common clock so they can efficiently route the data from your phones anywhere in the world. 
You lose GPS, you lose your common timestamp, and the cell phone network may or may not function at all, let alone very well. Massive problem if we lose GPS. GPS was originally developed for the military, right? Smart bombs, our troops know where they need to be. Go back and look at the Gulf War. I work in Huntsville for the Civilian Space Agency, but we share real estate with the U.S. Army Missile Command at Redstone Arsenal. The first Gulf War, way back in the 90s, was called the First Space War because our troops knew exactly where they were and the other guys didn't. We were using GPS-guided munitions, GPS was steering our ships, it was used to help navigate the planes, it's used today with our drones, it's indispensable to warfare. There's pre-GPS bombing, current bombing, right? So it's incredible for the, for the Army, for the Navy. Uh, we have uh, talked to folks who are in the Navy, any active duty military in here, or, or recent military in the room. Well, what I, it's my understanding talking to some colleagues that are in the Navy, the ships at sea now, basically, they can do dead reckoning. Almost everything, though, is GPS navigation. And it's not just military ships. It's all those cargo ships that carry goods from country to country, to carry our food from country to country, all use GPS navigation. One of the things that's key to keeping peace, Ukraine. We were able to see right now what Russia's military is doing on the border of Ukraine because of spy satellites. Spy satellites probably prevented World War III during the Cold War. You, get, you know if somebody's attacking you, the instant they do it, you see a military buildup before they do it. Just for keeping the peace, spy satellites are indispensable. It's a space technology we would have in great danger from some, some of the events I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Pretty scary world situation. I would not want to be in the modern world with all the bad guys out there and lose the capability of looking down and seeing what everybody's doing. Of course, satellite phones, needless to say, those are going to go if you lose your satellites. I mentioned VSATs at the beginning of my talk. Well, these very small aperture terminals are everywhere. And they now do more than just check your credit cards and your telecheck. Turns out that some of the biggest companies in the world do their inventory management, do their financial transactions, keep their books and transfer encrypted data through VSATs by satellite. There are banks now that do interbank fund transfers and do currency trading at night or any time of the day by satellite communication. You know, money is no longer paper money. It's no longer gold. It's bits of data, right? I guess Bitcoin on steroids, right? If you look at all the money that's transferred among the Federal Reserve Banks, it's all done by satellite transmission. You know, we tend to take for granted accurate weather forecasts, hurricanes. In the book, I talk a little bit about the difference between a hurricane that hit Galveston in 1906 and the one that hit less than a decade ago. Uh, 6,000 people dead versus a couple or none because people knew exactly where to evacuate, where the hurricane is going. You can tell people when it's headed toward Galveston, you don't need to evacuate New Orleans. You save hundreds of millions of dollars and save lives from accurate weather forecasts. We can't do that without satellites. They save lives and money. Human spaceflight, needless to say, I'm a big proponent of going to space. What an awful thing it would be if we junk up Earth orbit and we can't get out. Right? Did you see Wall-E? Right? And that, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's, it could be like that if we don't do something about stopping this orbital debris. I also want to mention the remote sensing. Countries all over the world now use satellite data to locate resources for industry. You can actually, from space, determine through microwave radiometry, the passive microwave emissions of the soil how much moisture content there is in soil. So you can predict where there's gonna be drought. You can tell farmers when the optimum time to plant their crops are. And in, the, and in places like Mexico, when they have these tropical storms, they're actually able to predict where the landslides are gonna happen from passive observation of soil moisture from space. A lot of countries now are dependent on this. 
saves a lot of money and a lot of effort by looking down from space. Communications. If we had a loss of satellites and these other things go down, people are going to want to know what's happening. They won't find out. Cable television doesn't go from the broadcaster through a cable to your home. It comes off of a geosynchronous satellite. You lose satellites, you lose communication. The satellite feeds these days are, are automated for the most part and global in nature. So almost all of our communications would be damaged. One that a lot of people don't think about but is vital for commerce is just-in-time manufacturing. The only way you can do just-in-time manufacturing is if you know exactly when the parts you need to build whatever it is you're building are going to come through the door. Well, how do they manage that? Well, they know what they need. They transmit the data typically through a system that relies on a satellite to where it comes from. It's put on trucks that navigate by GPS and are tracked by the company so they know where they are in the supply chain to get to you where you have to make your widget that depends on these parts that has to come in the door within hours of when you need it for your manufacturing. All that would be damaged and not usable with the loss of satellites, in particular with the loss of GPS. New York City, three days away from famine. If you go to New York at night, the cars are replaced by food trucks bringing in the supplies to the groceries, to the co-op, to the, to the restaurants. Cars go away, trucks come in. This food all navigates and is managed through VSAT inventory control, GPS navigation. It's all dependent on that infrastructure. And this is the chart I mentioned. I won't, I won't say it was an NRO satellite, that's just a cool picture. But mm -hmm. there, there have been satellites hacked, and I would suspect the certain three-letter organizations know how to hack other people's satellites, but I would only be speculating at that point. So what I want to leave you with, and I'll take questions, is this. Space technology is great. I'm a big advocate of it. I am so glad that we're finding all these innovative uses for it. But as I've outlined in this talk, it also kind of scares me because we have made ourselves dependent on a very fragile, infrastructure that's just over our heads in an environment that we think is safe because it's out of reach of most people but we're doing things to put it in danger and as more and more people have access to space they can willfully put this infrastructure in danger if I were asked what would be the impact of a Carrington event even if it didn't affect any systems on the ground and it just affected commercial satellites my answer would be at a minimum we would have a depression because of the effect on commerce and industry and the financial industry and financial transactions, you would not be able to efficiently have bread on the shelves at the grocery store. You wouldn't be able to conduct credit card transactions. Can you imagine having to overnight go to cash only? All right, banks can't transfer their funds. Truck drivers and trucking is, is, is pretty much at a standstill. Commercial aviation stops because the, the navigation system is out. The ships at sea, which rely on, on GPS tracking and navigation, are now inefficiently going from place to place. At a minimum, it's a depression. At the worst case, I think a lot of people would die because of the breakdown of the infrastructure, particularly the food and medicines infrastructure. My daughter is a type 1 diabetic. Her insulin is made in Europe and comes to the U.S. by air travel and air commerce. All right. I stock up about a three-month supply of insulin. Do we think if we lost our satellites, we would have that infrastructure back up within three months? I doubt it, okay? So this could be a very real threat, not just some abstract threat. And so what I'm, I'm very pleased to report is that the orbital debris problem is being addressed by most countries in the world now, not all, uh, most particularly not China has not signed up to all of the accords that the rest of the world has to limit the orbital debris growth problem. No nation is yet actively removing debris to try to get this half million pieces of junk out of orbit. It's too expensive. It would be considered an unfunded mandate. If you're NASA or the European Space Agency or even the Department of Defense 
And I come up and I say, I've got a new job for you. I want you to send satellites into space to get rid of all this junk. And it's going to cost $100 million per pop to go get 10 pieces because space access is so expensive. You're going to say, okay, I'll do that. Where's my increase in budget? And then I laugh at you, right? No, 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 you do this from what you have. So no one wants this job because it means you have to stop doing other things to go become the garbage man, right? To go clean all this up in space. How, how would you clean up? Oh, there are lots of cool ideas. Uh, the question was asked, how would you clean it up? There are lots of ways you could do that. The, the biggest thing we can do to try to reduce the growth of the debris is get rid of the dead satellites. Those are big. And so you could conceivably go to those with another spacecraft and grab them and move them physically. You could go up and attach something that would inflate a balloon to increase its surface area and increase the drag against what little atmosphere is there, and it would slowly spiral in and burn up. You could also, if you want to get rid of, but that doesn't get rid of the half million pieces of little debris. That would just get rid of the big stuff. The only way we've, that I've seen that makes sense to get rid of the little stuff probably violates more than one or two treaties, and that would be to put a laser in space and you basically zap them. And if you burn away a little bit of those uh, pieces of small debris, it acts like a rocket engine and gives it a, a trajectory that you can cause it to burn up. You basically knock it out of orbit. You don't zap it and cause it to vaporize. You zap it in such a way that you push it so that it goes into an orbit where it'll come in and burn up. The problem is if you miss, you might hit another satellite and you've got a potential you know, disaster in the making there also. So there are things you can do about that. We've chosen to uh, make ourselves dependent on uh, orbital communications, and yet uh, fiber is a better solution. In a very few years, fiber could, and even today, has better bandwidth than all the satellites put together. Why not use fiber? You could do that for a lot of the communications. You, you sure could, and in fact, I know that's happening. Um, if you look at the, uh, the radio output of the planet, I'm a space geek, right? So I think about if somebody's out in space looking at us, right, are they going to find us? We were far noisier 40 years ago than we are today. And it's because of the efficiency of our systems. We don't have as much le leakage radiation. But we've also laid a lot of ground lines and a lot of fiber. Yeah, you're right. That, that would be one and way to mitigate that. That, by its very nature, is uh, essentially immune to the uh, solar flare activity and except the uh, doomsday scenario. You could do a lot. You could do a lot with that. I, I think there's concern about the security for of the fiber. You guys again make me paranoid about that at every turn. Um, but um, well, and and also things happen. Nothing's completely secure. And nothing's completely without risk. I, I think we should be doing more of that. I really do. I think we need some kind of redundancy, some kind of backup. Absolutely. What you mentioned had to do with geosynchronous. That's right. Uh, so that's the dirtiest orbit potential. That's right. On uh, very large coronal mass injections, would that be a death sentence for astronauts serving aboard the International Space Station? It could be, but they would have warning. We have a, we have a satellite called the Advanced Composition Explorer, the ACE, which is located at the Earth-Sun Lagrange point, L1, which means it's in a quasi-gravitationally stable place, and it, it kind of stays between us and the sun all the time, all right? So when these coronal mass ejections are coming out from the sun and the radiation passes the ACE satellite, its radiation detectors go, whoa, we've got something happening. And it actually sends a radio broadcast to the Earth and light travels faster than this particle radiation. So we get about eight to 10 minutes warning. And there are lifeboats on the space station that if there's a fire or it gets hit by a big piece of debris or if there's a big radiation storm coming, the astronauts are actually trained to very quickly get in these lifeboats and come home. So I think um, they would be able to get away. If, if you have time, uh, uh, one thing I think uh, all of us uh, don't get that you probably have a handle on is since space is a big place and you mentioned it about satellites being low, mid, or high, like where is this stuff? Like, where are weather satellites? Where are GPS satellites? Where are communication satellites in this orbit range? Well, the, most of the, a lot of, well, the, 
There are geosynchronous satellites, of course, a geosynchronous orbit, which is out at 20-some thousand miles, and that's pretty far out. Uh, the GPS satellites are what, call, are what, in, what I call mid-Earth orbit. They're, they're above five to 700 kilometers, but inside geo, and they, there are a lot of satellites that are in that few thousand kilometer altitude range. A lot of satellites are in low Earth orbit, which means they're under a thousand kilometers, and that's the region I worry about the most, because that's the most accessible, and there's a lot of junk there. Now, the really low Earth orbit stuff re-enters over time, but you get around 700 kilometers, that's far enough out that it's going to be around for a long time, and there are a lot of satellites there. A lot of weather satellites, a lot of communication satellites, a lot of defense satellites. The uh, Earth observation spacecraft are there. So there, there's a lot in those what altitudes. What was the effect that you called that where the satellites cascaded each other and destroyed each other? What yeah, the Kessler, Kessler effect, named after Jason Kessler. It, was that tried, at least to be portrayed in the movie Gravity? Is that yes, what supposed to that's be? what they were trying to do. Don't, don't get me going about the orbital mechanics of gravity. but. <laughs> gravity. Um, <laughs> I've consulted on two movies. Has anybody seen Europa Report? Go see Europa Report. It's a fun movie. They get the science right. I was one of the consultants, and they, it was a real pleasure working with that crew because they wanted it to be right. Now, you'll throw things at me when I tell you the other movie I consulted on because the director ignored me, and that was uh, back early at my time at NASA, the uh, remake of Lost in Space. Okay? So the science and that's horrible, but they told me they would ignore me if it conflicted with what they wanted to do, and boy, did they ignore me. Um, but it was kind of cool to see your name up there. But some, some movies will try to get it right and actually come and talk to people who know I'm consulting on a movie that's being made right now. And the director's really trying to get it right. Others don't care so much. And I really enjoy Gravity, and that's what they were trying to portray on Gravity. But it was very dramatic, right? And, and it wouldn't happen as laid out in, in Gravity at all. It would, that wouldn't happen that quickly. When you were making reference to the alert on CME, um, it's the uh, Solar Observatory in Netherlands, Colorado, who's the gatekeeper for our observation of the sun. And uh, they have a couple of phones on the console that will let you talk to all of the responsible satellite operators throughout the world to initiate an alert from there. There's actually a field called Space Weather, yeah. and, and our Space Weather headquarters is in Colorado, and if you get on the internet and you Google Space Weather, it's kind of the equivalent of NOAA, and in fact NOAA runs a lot of it, well, but it's for space and a short distance from the NOAA operation. I worked there for a couple of years. Oh, good. Cool. Very cool. It's real. It is real. Space Weather is, uh, is a very real field, and uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of people involved in that because it can save a lot of money for satellites to, to do that. I have some more questions. Yeah. One hazard I, I don't believe you mentioned is when you're having the, the meteor showers, which basically cometary debris, what, what are the odds of that taking out a satellite? Very, very low. Because uh, the stuff from a comet that you see that makes shooting stars like in a meteor shower, most of that is the size of a grain of sand. Most of the, it's the size of a grain of sand, smaller than a pea. They're moving really fast. They're moving faster than orbital stuff. These, this stuff coming in to the atmosphere as opposed to eight kilometers a second, wow, it can be moving at 20 to 25 kilometers a second, really, really fast, because the Earth's moving through this debris field. But it's few and far between. They're very, it, it, it looks like a lot, but it's across a great distance and it's at night and everything lights up. You, there really isn't that much. There is a concern, and they watch closely, and, and it's been thought a few times that satellites may have been hit during uh, meteor showers by this cometary debris, but it's very, very rare. And that goes back to my opening statement about space being big. It is big, right? And it's tend to, it, we tend to not realize just how much volume there is up there. And that's why these half million pieces of debris don't collide more often. But they're circling the planet every 90 minutes, and pretty soon the laws of probability are going to work against you. You know? Um, have there been any uh, successful hacking attempts on satellites that have actually you know, taken something out? Not to my knowledge. There, there have been reported hacks where someone has gotten to the point where they could have commanded a satellite, but had the good sense not to do it. Okay? Uh, my guess would be, and this is just a guess, remember I'm here as a private citizen, not representing NASA, so this is just Les Johnson pontificating. 
I would guess it's one of those uh, sponsored by other government groups just to see what they could do, if I had to guess. I would hope it's not a 15-year-old in their basement, but you never know. Uh, so this may be a stupid question, but uh, cleaning up the satellites when they, when they burn up in our orbit, does that affect us in any way? No, no. There is, uh, what, what a lot, what, what's pretty amazing to me, there is tons of dust that enters the atmosphere and comes to the surface every year just from space, from the debris that we fly through that's nature's debris. And when satellites burn up, unless it's a big piece that's very solid, and when Skylab came in, there were big pieces of Skylab that reached the ground. And there are big satellites that intentionally re-enter over the South Pacific where there's no one around, right? to do that in case something makes it to the surface. But most of this stuff just burns up in the upper atmosphere and essentially just vaporizes. And it'll add a little bit of pollution to the atmosphere, but compared to what my car put out driving up here, you know, probably not a whole lot. So um, it's, it's not anything to really worry about. There, there have not been, to my knowledge, any reported cases of anyone on the ground being hit by space debris. There is a woman back several years ago in Alabama who was actually hit by a meteor, a meteorite when it hit. Uh, it went through her roof and bounced around in the house and finally hit her leg and bruised her leg. And of course it was a woman in Alabama that gets hit by a meteor, right? But, um, and it's documented to be a real, a real hit, but that's about the only thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. I can say that because I live in Alabama now. I can, I can do that. Okay, well, well, thank you. I'll be giving a few more talks, and if anybody's interested, one of the reasons, I, one of the ways I'm able to come up here is by, by selling a few books. Um, I do have copies of uh, this book, Sky Alert When Satellites Fail, it's published by Springer. I'm not a self-published author. I have, I have two publishers. My uh, nonfiction books are published by Springer, and I have uh, a book on solar sailing. If you really want to know the future of really cool space exploration and unique technology, come to my talk tomorrow at noon on solar sailing. And I'll, I'll tell you everything that's going on about solar sails. Um, I've also got a book back there called uh, Living Off the Land in Space. And it's about how we can use the resources of space to support uh, a sustainable in-space civilization, actually. And I've also been very fortunate. I also write science fiction now for Bayon books, if any of you are Bayon readers. Uh, my latest book came out in hardcover with my co-author, who you may have heard of. His name's Ben Bova. And uh, it's called Rescue Mode. It came out this summer. And I've got that back there for sale also. But thank you very much, and I'll see you around for the next uh, few days.